tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Jacquet. Um, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University, where she studies human dimensions of large-scale social dilemmas, such as overfishing and climate change. Um, she received a PhD in Resource Management and Environmental Studies from the University of British Columbia, and she's also a former writer for the Guilty Planet blog for at Scientific American, and she contributes to the online think tank edge.org. Um, her latest new, bo uh, new book, her first book, I guess, mm -hmm. congratulations, um, is Shame Necessary, examines the evolution, function, and future of the use, a f a future use of the use of social disapproval. And the argument is that shame, when used judiciously, is actually a powerful source of political change and social reform and can be used to shame corporations and governments into embracing more responsible behavior. Um, and I hope you will have some questions. We'll have a great discussion. And now please, please welcome Jennifer Jackwet. Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, since there aren't very many people, I figure I'll just kind of be informal up here and see how this goes. I'm used to having slides in the background, and so I'm going to try this old school paper style. I thought I would just ask um, how many of you have ever sat on an inflatable sofa? Um, this is a part in the book I mentioned on page 10. I talk about the personal shame of my dad bringing home an inflatable sofa. Um, a lot of my friends have written to me asking what did that mean and what was going on. And my parents actually were getting a divorce at that time. They, they wound up not getting divorced, but um, my dad got an apartment on his own. And in that apartment, not as like an additional piece of furniture, but as like his primary piece of furniture was an inflatable sofa. And for me, this moment in seeing him in this apartment by himself with an inflatable sofa felt to me like this profound sense of personal shame and that my dad's life was like full of pool toys, I guess, in the future. And that feeling is really memorable. I was 19. I can remember exactly like how the room smelled. Um, and that's because these emotions like shame, personal shame, are painful and very memorable. That is not what this book is about. This is not about the feeling of your dad buying an inflatable sofa. It's not about the personal shame that doesn't allow you to connect with people or form deep relationships. It's not about the deep personal shame that prevents you from getting up in the morning. It's about a different form of shame. It's about the type of tool that you can use to change behavior. And oftentimes this form of shame actually requires a lot of courage. And it's a type of shame that can obviously do good or bad, but has been used by groups to stop mountaintop removal. Um, it's been used to stop entire governments from executing juvenile offenders. It's been used to cause SeaWorld's stock value to plummet 60%, which is what's happened this year. And again, this book, even th th I, I'm getting like a lot of requests from sort of self-help radio shows. And I know that's my own fault because I use this powerful word, shame, in the title. But this book is really more about group help. It's not about the feeling of personal shame. It's about the power of social disapproval and the power of reputation to change things at scale. So before I talk about shame, I really want to talk about another painful emotion, um, which is guilt. And psychologists have been working on guilt for a long time. In fact, Roy Baumeister did a study in the Netherlands showing that people in the Netherlands, at least, feel guilty for about two hours every day of their life. This must be like low-level guilt kind of thing. Um, I feel guilty. I feel guilty at this very moment for having forgotten to call my mom this weekend. I feel guilty that I didn't send my sister a, a birthday present. And this feeling of guilt is sort of just constantly there in the background of our lives. But there is the argument that guilt is a really recent phenomenon, and it's also a Western phenomenon. Psychologists also argue it's the better emotion compared to shame because it allows you to uh, make reparation more easily. So like in the case of not feeling guilty for not calling my mom, I can just call her, alleviate my guilt. Whereas with shame, it says something more about your whole self. So the thing um, about guilt is that 
Oh, another, uh, just a few more facts about guilt, because it's, it's so fun. Uh, not mentioned in the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, it was used 33 times by Shakespeare, whereas shame was used 344. There's this idea that guilt is pretty new on the spectrum of emotion. And I think there are lots of really interesting reasons um, that we all speculate about why that's the case. My own feeling is that it has to do with the rise of not just individualism, which a lot of other people agree with, but the rise of physical privacy. And it's very hard to feel guilt when you're around other people all the time. So there's another type of guilt that's not related to your own individual actions. And this guilt, I think, I, I mean, in, for some way, in some ways to me, it feels quite modern. I'm sure it's not that modern, but I think it's a, a pretty widespread phenomenon because I have a Google alert for green guilt uh, to feel bad about what's happening to the planet, to feel bad about social injustice, inequality, animal welfare, climate change, overfishing. And I can remember, again, having that, the, you know, like personal shame I remember very well. I remember very well the first time I felt this, this type of guilt, which was when I was nine years old, had just written to a group called the Earth Island Institute. They responded to me. And I got this black and white photo of a dolphin being killed uh, by tuna vessels in the, um, in the Pacific in the mail. So I was in my room, opened it up, black and white photograph, and I had this feeling that was the first kind of that feeling I'd ever had, which was, I can't believe something I'm doing, which was eating tuna, was contributing to a problem like this. And I was um, among the group of children, um, very enamored with Flipper, had never seen a dolphin in the wild, um, but forced my parents to boycott tuna. We stopped eating it, and lots of kids across the nation did that as well. And this large-scale boycott of the major tuna industries in the U.S. then led to this thing called the Dolphin Safe logo or the Dolphin Friendly logo in the U.K. And I realized the problem, in my mind, in my nine-year-old mind, that the problem was fixed. We started eating tuna again, and I didn't think about the problem for more than a decade. And when I did, it was because I started doing academic research related to these market-based certification tools. And at that point, I realized that in many ways we had been duped. And what I realize now is that I lived through this period, which I think was really interesting, where we shifted our focus from changing supply to changing demand. And I have all sorts of proof that this is the case, and I'll just uh, read off a few of them. Dolphin safe, cage free, organic, fair trade, shade grown, sustainable, cruelty free, carbon neutral, carbon offset. All of these types of products that suggest that the responsibility for this wide array of problems was actually in the hands of a few individual consumers, rather than being something that society or the political system at large should address. So I think this is really a product of the anti-regulatory era and the feeling that obviously supply and demand are balanced on two opposite sides of the ledger. And rather than necessarily focusing on supply, if we change demand, supply would follow. But the problem has been that these markets remain, for all of these products, niche markets, very small. In the case of organic foods, it's still only about 4% of the US market. And collective action problems like pesticide use, like animal welfare, um, like dolphin unsafe tuna, can't be solved by the, by the actions of a very small minority. So what has happened in that period of time as well is that all of us have heard this message you can't really talk about these problems because you're part of the problem. In fact, I was just reading this piece in The Guardian about Naomi Klein, and it said she's not your traditional environmentalist. She has a, a, a play set in the backyard that's clearly made in China. Um, she flies a lot. She owns a car, admittedly a hybrid. And I just thought, this is such a strange caveat. Like, we're all part of the system. The fact, I mean, was there an alternate even a, a play shed for her kid that she could get that wasn't made in China. It, it was all very strange. But 
the main message about all of this sort of focus on the consumerism and, and how you consume is that some people could change their consumer habits to suit uh, their guilt or this market, and the rest of people could continue and did to buy the same old stuff. So pesticides, unfair trade, destructive fishing gear, it all still exists today. Many of it at, this, at a similar scale that it did 30 years ago. I asked this question in the book too, but would Cesar Chavez have been okay with a solution that said, oh, we're just gonna have some farms that pay workers a minimum wage and consumers that are concerned about that will buy the grapes from those farms that, that pay a minimum wage and there's a label on those grapes and then the rest of the industry can keep doing what it wants if there's a market that will buy grapes bought, you know, or, or made with, uh, with low wage labor. I think Cesar Chavez would have laughed at that. I mean, it's kind of absurd, the idea that there would be only a niche market. His idea was to change labor standards everywhere, not just for a select few, and not just to ease the consciences of a few consumers. So my main thesis is just that this guilt that we all feel, and that's a very decent response, is, has been uh, used by the market, it's much more marketable than shame, and has a, in the process co-opted and even eclipsed shame over the last, I'd say, 25 years. Now, that's not to say that shame doesn't exist, and we have proof in the audience that it's alive and well, but I don't think it's necessarily being used to the, the full degree that it, could, that it could be, and I want to talk about that a bit more. So again, just to summarize about the whole issue with guilt, if I buy organic foods but everyone else doesn't, pesticides continue to leak into the, into the water supply, let's say. If I stop flying but everyone else continues to fly, carbon emissions continue to increase. If I immunize my child but not everyone else immunizes their child. This is the whole essence of cooperative dilemmas and especially these cooperative dilemmas that have what we call a threshold where we need a certain amount of buy-in to even achieve the kind of um, blanket behavior that's good for society. So as individuals, of course, and, and guilt ties us to a, an individual conscience and therefore an individual choice, which is fine, except that the individual is not necessarily the ideal unit of change. And as individuals, we have more power than just as consumers. So. One of the points, and what there are many tools that individuals could use, but one of them, of course, is a tool mentioned in the title of the book that can work against the state, against the system, against corporations. So some groups, like I mentioned, are still daring to use shame. John Hosevar leads up the Oceans <laughs> Campaign for Greenpeace. They had a great campaign, maybe he can talk about it during the Q&A, against Trader Joe's to end the sale of certain uh, species of unsustainable seafood. I mentioned in the introduction how Rainforest Action Network has actually gone um, after the banks that do the financing of the coal companies that do mountaintop removal in Appalachia. So what's interesting about that campaign is they said nobody knows who these coal companies are, consumers aren't familiar with them, but they are familiar with the banks. So we're going to target the banks and go after them year after year, and in the fifth year, there were nine banks, only two so far, but still uh, two, let me just make sure I get them right, J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, um, have ended their ties to the coal industry. I like the example, too, of human rights groups like Amnesty International targeting the United States, showing that the U.S. in 2004 was among <coughs> seven other countries in the world, like Iraq and Yemen, who were still executing juvenile offenders. And they even had this sort of map of rogue countries which highlighted these, these uh, Iran, Nigeria, Pakistan. And that along with a bunch of science actually, and of course a court case, did lead to the US Supreme Court overruling um, and outlawing juvenile executions in 2005. The film Blackfish, has anyone seen it? It's this master piece of shame, actually. It, there's a clear target and there's all this drama. Um, since that film's release, 
SeaWorld stock price has fallen 60%, but also its attendance has declined nearly 5%, and revenues fell 7% in the first nine months of 2014. This is just a film, and it's had a major impact on the way SeaWorld is obviously uh, doing business, but as well as it started um, a lot of legislation to put an end to orcas in captivity in many different U.S. states. I'll let you tell us about the Trader Joe's campaign, John, in depth. But the cool thing about the, the getting to do the research for this book was getting to find studies about shaming across all these different domains. And I just wanted to mention three. One was um, in medical literature that showed that shaming actually had uh, the same kind of uh, effect at decreasing smoking that attacks on cigarettes had. So this was like dirty looks and... Um, yeah, and sort of the classic type of interactive street shame that we all feel uh, for smoking. Um, one experiment uh, that I mentioned in the book was one I did where um, we allowed students to give to a, a sort of group pool, and we doubled that money and then redistributed it among all students. And they had the option to give or not to the pool. And no matter if they gave, they would still benefit from those donations. So it's very much like a group project. You know, you could free ride off the, the work of others, or you could contribute your fair share. And in our experiments where we said at the end of 10 rounds of playing this game, we're going to expose the two least generous players, and then in another treatment we said we'll expose the two most generous players, both shame and honor actually led to a 50% increase in cooperation. What was great is having found that, then I went and looked in this um, political science literature on voting behavior. So voting is actually pretty similar actually, uh, to the, the game that we are playing with these students. And there were these um, researchers who allowed, or uh, in different cities, they had a natural field experiment, which is really fun. In, in Michigan and Iowa, they told people that the names of people who voted in the last election would be published in the newspaper. And then in another town in Iowa, they said, people here who do not vote, your name will be published in the, in the newspaper. So it was an honor treatment and a shame treatment, just like we had in the experiments. And in both cases, um, it led to increased voter turnout. The most interesting thing is that in the shame treatment, where they said we will publish the names of people who do not vote, it led to people turning out who hadn't voted in the last two or three elections, whereas the honor treatment led to people turning out who hadn't voted in the last single election. So they distinguish these between, they call them high propensity and low propensity voters. Now, I realize that's kind of getting away from my main point, which was that shame can be work on groups and can scale, and we can get away from this personal shaming that everyone's talking about in the media these days. But Keep in mind that empirical work on shaming in the laboratory tends to focus on the individual because it's the easiest way to run an experiment. And the other thing to keep in mind is that all three of these studies share something similar, which is that the problem that they examine is a cooperative one. It's not about an individual choice that doesn't affect the rest of the group. It, it's, a, it's a social dilemma. So I mentioned that honor worked in both those cases, in my experiments as well as the voting one. So a lot of you will probably be thinking to yourselves for very good reasons, why not use honor then? It's so much nicer than shame, it creates a better world. <laughs> but I wanna ask you, how do we honor people who pay their taxes? So over 90% of people pay their taxes, their state taxes. Should we honor them for doing that? It's the expectation, right, that you should pay your taxes. So instead, the state of California, for instance, has introduced a shaming campaign. This is the state, and they are going after people who do not pay their taxes, and they're going after people who owe in excess of $100,000. They have a top 500 list. And what's interesting is that they threaten shame. They actually send them a letter that your name will be on this website in six months if you do not pay your personal income tax. And the program costs about $131,000 a year to run, and they've gotten over $389 million in <laughs> delinquent tax money back from this program. So three things of note about the California state shaming. 
well, four things really. One, they, they threaten it before they use it, which is really interesting and important point. Two, honor wouldn't work in this circumstance. When the threshold is that high, when 90, 95% of people are paying their taxes, honor's off the table as an option because the majority, the vast majority, are already on board. The state is actually involved in this shaming, which makes us all a little uncomfortable, I'm sure, for very good reasons, and I want to circle about, back to those. And again, even individuals are shamed in this case. So that means that there could be some individual effects like human dignity or maybe even some of those experiences of personal shame that we were talking about at the very beginning. So shame has gotten this dirty, it's become a sort of dirty word and a bad, it's gotten a bad reputation itself. And I'm not here to defend every form of shaming. There are plenty of terrible forms. But I will say that it's not, we shouldn't necessarily, and it's very much the knee-jerk reaction, call to mind the scarlet letter or the stocks or the ducking stool. There are so many other forms of powerful shaming today. And what happened with those forms of shaming, which were used by the state and are still used in places around the world, including China having a big issue with state shaming right now and trucking around recently in the media um, prostitutes in the, in a, and having them line up on the streets, is that the state had another option for punishment that, that rose, and that's why it got rid of the shaming. It wasn't because it didn't work. It's because they, they had this other option, which was prison. And the rise of prison actually was what led to the decline of state shaming. And for, for us as citizens, as individuals, we don't have this tool, obviously. We are left with very few options for social control. Now, the other thing to note is that we don't really want, we want the state involved in most punishment, and we don't want to be policing one another because this is the essence of sort of civilization. The state is supposed to relieve us of our burden to punish others. But in some cases where we do think punishment is necessary and, we, and the state is not intervening or there are no formal routes for punishment, um, this is when even the crowd will call on shame. So I wanted to just uh, talk about what I call the seven habits of highly effective shaming. <laughs> And I thought I would read them from the book so that I would get them right, basically. And talk about what makes uh, something more or less effective than another with a couple case studies. OK, so shaming is a potent tool, but its power, as with anti antibiotics, depends a lot on whether the proper dose is used at the right time. Given that we can all use shame, we should all be interested in using shame selectively and well. The recipe for effective shaming begins with an obvious transgression against a norm, an obvious transgressor, and a desired and achievable outcome. I'll now lay out seven additional habits of highly effective shaming. I use the term habits because they are, they are rules. They're not rules, but generalities. In brief, here they are. The transgression should, one, concern the audience, two, deviate widely from desired behavior, three, not be expected to be formally punished. The transgressor should be part of the group doing the shaming. The shaming should, five, come from a res respected source, six, be directed where possible benefits are highest, and seven, be implemented conscientiously. If shaming sticks closely to these habits, it's likely to play an effective role in changing behavior. And the two cases that I start the book out with, which I, I ask you to consider only because we're all part of these sort of um, invitations to be part of the audience for shame, because shame is nothing without the audience. And the two are um, a, an app called Gripe. Has anyone in here ever used it or heard about it? It's an app where you can basically complain that a, a business did something wrong. And sorry, I'm coming in from the cold. And you can say, uh, the example I used, which I found online, was that a Thai food delivered, uh, a Thai restaurant delivered the food 30 minutes late. So this guy shames the Thai restaurant through his social networks and then basically asks them to either give him new food or a gift certificate or in some ways make it up to him. So Gripe has been used a lot for like airlines and 
uh, ATMs and all sorts of problems. There's also an, uh, I mean, there are lots of these apps now today. There's an app that will allow you to alert your friends if you oversleep. So if you press snooze too much, it sends a, a notice to all of your friends and it's like a self-shaming technique. But I don't care if um, my friends oversleep. Like they can oversleep all they want. So, and then I want to contrast that to another example, which was the, um, the case of uh, exposing the 100 worst air polluter polluters in the United States. So this is a list. It's out of the, there's a research institution in Massachusetts. And the two are, are so different, and they, they, one really matches up to those seven habits, and the other one really doesn't. And I, I again, want to sort of just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll walk you through a few of them so that you can see that I uh, did some homework here. So, for instance, uh, I, I mean, this, this issue about the transgression concerning the audience, I already mentioned, should deviate widely from desired behavior. So this is what's interesting in the voting case, because 90% of people think that you should vote. And yet, less than half of people actually vote in non-presidential elections. So that gap between desired and actual behavior is really large. That's when the shaming can come in. If 88% if of people voted and 90% of people thought you should vote, it would really not be a good, uh, a good case to, to bring in shame at all, because more or less the behavior is, is aligned with what we think is is sort of normal. Um, we should not expect the transgression to be formally punished. So I bring up a case in the book about a judge who keys his neighbor's car as he walks by, and he actually was taken to trial for that and fined. And yet his neighbor still put that video online to shame him additionally, which to me seems like a waste of public attention. He was already taken to court and published for, uh, punished formally. I didn't see why he needed to um, ask for our attention in that case. Um, shaming should come from a respected source. Again, John Hosovar, Greenpeace, knows something about this. Because if, um, or maybe let's draw on another example. Um, Greenpeace has actually very high uh, trust ratings among the public, not always among academics, but we all know that they don't know everything. and. Um, Another group where this really comes to mind is um, the Westboro Baptist Church. Do you know this group? They love shame. They're always using shame. And they, came, they went to Silverton, Oregon to protest this guy named Stu Rasmussen, who um, was the first openly uh, transgender elected mayor of this town called Silverton, Oregon. And they came in, and lots of people in the town sort of expressed like a little bit of they were a little wary about the whole transgender thing. They liked Stu, they knew him from the um, cinema, which he ran, but they were just like, yeah, the dressing as a woman thing, like, it'd be cooler if he didn't do it. But then after the Westboro Baptist Church came in and they tried to shame Stu Rasmussen, and they really, um, they were protesting his whole election, the townspeople actually gathered in force, rallying behind Stu. Men turned out in, in uh, women's clothing, in support of him, and the shaming actually had the effect of, of shifting the norm the exact opposite direction that they had hoped. I mean, that just shows you that it, this, this is a dangerous tool, it really can backfire, but when the shame does not come from a respected source, and that was the thing, is that people really saw the Westboro Baptist Church as outsiders, um, also as nutcases, which is pretty much their, their uh, MO. Um, again, shaming should be directed where possible benefits are highest. And in that case, I also mean, like, it should just be aimed well. A good example of this was um, John Stewart. Did anyone see how he dealt with on The Daily Show, the Brian Williams case? So everyone's talking about truth and veracity and this quest for really getting uh, to the essence of the Brian Williams scandal. And John Stewart plays the whole run, as, he's, as he always does of the mainstream news media attacking whoever it is, in this case, Brian Williams. And then he said, yeah, I'm so glad the media is finally looking for the truth. Wouldn't it have been nice if they did this during the whole weapons of mass destruction um, claim uh, before we even went to Iraq, before Brian Williams had to be, have this, this incident? And he just refocused our attention to where 
actually the benefits were highest and also at the transgression that affected all of us in a much deeper way than Brian Williams having said that he was in a helicopter um, that got shot down. And the final um, advice for, again, effective shaming, which is not the same thing as acceptable shaming, is that it should be implemented conscientiously. And that just means that you have to have, there's an art to shaming. And the, and the guy that I think really understood this the most is a guy named Antonis Marcus, who I use to close the book because he's so a beautiful master of shame. And he, uh, he and shamelessness, because what he did was, um, he was the president of the university in Bogota and to get the student body attention when they were being rowdy, he mooned the audience. <laughs> and um, they did pay attention then and quiet down. But Antonis Mokas, uh, Mokas lost his job as the president. But it, because he had gotten everyone's attention, he was able to run this mayoral campaign. It was the cheapest in Colombia's history. And he became the mayor of Bogota on this platform of having mooned everyone. <laughs> So he already had this reputation as being kind of quirky. And he continued that, and he did so many really interesting um, acts at, uh, at attempting for self-regulation using things like shame. And the most famous one, um, and, and I should say he also, in, in not just shameless, but he also showed extreme acts of bravery. So he always had to wear a bulletproof vest, for instance, when he went out around because he was in Bogota. And so he cut a heart-shaped uh, hole over the heart of the vest, which his security team hated. But he was, again, trying to push, push this culture of self-regulation, push people to really think about, um, about the norms and standards of behavior. And the thing he's most famous for, actually, was hiring. Uh, he started by hiring 40, and then eventually, I think, they hired 400 more mimes. Uh, who did street theater around the city mocking people's bad driving behavior. <laughs> so, uh, dri like, driving accidents were a huge source of mortality in the city. There was bad pedestrian behavior, bad, like, honking, no seatbelt wearing. And he got mimes involved in the whole, um, again, street theater of this cause. And they could actually show, they could show quantitatively that traffic accidents and deaths declined uh, after the introduction of these mimes. So he was really um, understood that, that shame, the best type of shame, obviously, was attention getting, but it also allowed for this uh, culture of forgiveness. Because if you can't reintegrate, if you can't change your behavior and then be part of the group again, that is, that's kind of the, the permanence, the stigma of shame that we really all have become less comfortable with. <laughs> so um, I just want to conclude with a few points. Shaming is a tool that. Um, we can each use. We're all potentially its victim, and that makes it scary. And we are all asked to participate in shaming every single day. And so the way that we are complicit as the audience in shaming matters, and the way we spend our attention on, on what punishments matter. So guilt is a totally decent response to the state of the planet or the state of animal welfare or even um, labor across the world. But engaging with guilt as a consumer alone is really not going to lead to long-term and effective change. And I do think shaming provides a way in which to make changes at large scale. So my main message, before I read just the closing of the book, is that all shaming is not created equally. Shaming does not want to be free. Use shaming with caution and be brave enough to aim well. <laughs> so here's the, um, the, just the last, because I, I actually said it better in the book. I'm going to just read this in closing. The more social the transgression, the sweeter the shame, because the audience is inherently interested in the bad behavior. Ultimately, shaming might not be enough to solve the problem. But the greater fallacy, particularly for collective action problems like climate change and overfishing, is the idea that we can individualize them. In our preoccupation with the spirit of individualism and free market ideology, we bought into the notion that the biggest way an individual can make a difference is as a consumer. 
This has allowed for the ascendancy of gilts, which helps sell products like sustainable seafood and organic foods and carbon counters. Consumers are swept up in using reusable bags and mugs and turning off the lights. This is like taking vitamin C after fracturing your skull in a car accident. It's not wrong, it's just so far from what is needed to actually fix things. For large-scale cooperation dilemmas, it is not sufficient that a small group of people feel guilty, and it is certainly not enough that this small group engage with that guilt as consumers. We need a tool that can work more quickly and at larger scales. We live on one planet. As far as we know, we're the only species that really understands that, and we alone bear the responsibility for balancing human interests and the interests of non-human life. Shame is one of many possible tools to help us get along. Who is us? Our neighbors, people inhabiting small island states threatened by sea li level rise, mountain gorillas in Central Africa. Successful species will likely be those that recognize implicitly or explicitly life's interdependency. Given that shaming is inextricably linked to norms, its role in our future is crucially dependent on what norms the future brings. For one species to mourn the death of another is a new thing under the sun, wrote Aldo Leopold in 1947. The crow magnon who slew the last mammoth thought only of stakes. The sportsman who spotted the last passenger pigeon thought only of his prowess. The sailor who clubbed the last auk thought of nothing at all. But we who have lost our pigeons mourn the loss. Had the funeral been ours, the pigeons would hardly have mourned us. This is our plight in the modern world. We now understand the exact dimensions, mass, and materials of the Earth, where it is suspended in the universe, the uniqueness of the life that inhabits it, the problems we have created on it, the solutions we have not implemented, and the solemn reality that this Earth is, to date, our only home and our only chance. The new norms required in this context are big ones, and their formation and reinforcement can be assisted by the wise use of shame. That's it. Thanks. Yeah, John, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, I um, I, I just wondered about the um, what the potential is for a saturation effect of shame, and whether anybody's done kind of any studies of this to try to quant in yeah. some way quantify this. It seems like even if you follow the seven principles that you. Uh, yeah. suggested there there's a potential for saturation effect yeah it seems still even if you say it, we want to follow the seven principles there's still a subjective decision as to what yeah. cause warrants shame yeah good and so, um, so it seems like um, there's the potential not only you get a, um, a saturation effect so that a shame, camp shame campaigns become progressively less effective or whatever because they get more widely used, even following the seven principles. Mm -hmm. um, but then it somehow it results in a, a lower guilt um, sort of feeling as well. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm still not entirely clear. You, the distinction that you yeah. have in your mind is the distinct the, between guilt and shame. I think of one as kind of more after the fact than the other. It's kind of sort of guilt being more during the fact or before discovery, and shame is after mm -hmm. discovery of some transgression. But um, um, it seems like, well, I don't know. Anyway, just the whole idea of saturation effect and the, how you go about. Um, avoiding that uh, unintended consequence. Yeah, this is, I mean, I think it's really interesting area. And there, uh, some people have mentioned to me, certainly not for me, but people with these quantitative skills, there's probably a Nobel Prize to be won in, in reputational game theory. And that would be the kind of question I think they'd be interested in. Originally, I thought uh, in the book I, that I would say that um, because shame was linked to our attention, it was a, a sort of zero-sum game. But it's it's clear that attention is a finite resource. But it's not clear necessarily that shaming has those exact same properties. So I'm not clear on that myself. And I, I mean, I, I don't know the point of saturation. I know that right now what I was really fighting against were the frivolous uses of shame and getting, trying to get people to engage more deeply with how they, they spent their attention or, 
or provided an audience for certain transgressions. Also, I mean, I wasn't intending to imply that even if you don't want to distinguish between guilt and shame, which is fine, actually, because certain cultures in the East don't even have a word for guilt. And it's very likely that these are just similar negative emotions. They play similar roles in our, each of our societies. It's the way that we engage then with, the, with that negative feeling. And I just felt like how I was constantly being asked to engage was as an individual consumer, that if I really felt terribly, I should just buy something else. And that seemed to me like a really hollow activity. This uh, is a master shamer. It's an honor to be here as the personification of shame. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I head up the Ocean's work at Greenpeace in the US. And as part of that, we do a fair bit of work on sustainable seafood. And in some ways, it's a good example of um, some of what you were saying in that a lot of the preceding work was mostly th similar to the Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood watch cards, the wallet cards. Maybe some of you have seen those. And that's the, I think there are a lot of good things about that. Um, but basically, it's the idea that if enough people are changing their buying practices, then it's going to change things in the ocean. And, it, it's a long shot, to say the least. Uh, and so instead, our approach was that, look, if supermarkets are going to sell us seafood, then it's their responsibility to make sure that what they sell us is sustainable in the first place. So we can walk in and not really think so much about it. Um, I, I believe in personal responsibility. I think it's a good thing, but um, I'm even more of a fan of corporate responsibility. And so in 2008, we started assessing supermarkets in terms of the sustainability of their seafood. We ranked them against each other in a really public way. And there were good things that happened towards the top of the ranking. Um, even though the very first report, we looked at 20 huge retail chains and they all failed. Um, six months later, we were starting to see progress and some of them made it up into the yellow. And now this last year, we looked at 26 chains and 22 of them have passed and some of them actually made it to what Greenpeace would call green. Um, so we saw the top end kind of competing against each other, and that was great. But a lot of the bottom end was pretty comfortable just sitting there, not really making a lot of progress. So we targeted them with public shaming campaigns. We went after the largest big box chain, Costco, until they improved enough to make it up into the yellow. We, as is in the book, went after uh, the poorest scoring national chain, which at the time was Trader Joe's, until they actually made it all the way up into the green. Um, and it was more fun for us than them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what is the definition of sustainable seafood? That is a good question. Uh, we basically looked at four different categories. Uh, we looked at red list and their criteria for that, depending on, um, we, we looked at the health of this, the stocks of the fish they were catching, the methods, the impact on the seafloor, uh, bycatch, things like that. Um, those types of criteria help us decide whether a seafood is sustainable or not. And then we also looked at the retailers in terms of um, the information they made available to customers, the um, efforts that they made to engage in sustainable policies beyond their own business. Um, and the policies that they adopted to make sure that the seafood they were selling was sustainable, those kinds of things. I so think no I mean, simple answers. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the point. Uh, an interesting point is with both transparency and then certainly with shaming, someone has to decide what that threshold of acceptable behavior is, which is kind of what you were referencing. And I think to just be very honest, it's clear, at least in the US, that in some ways the government is not doing its job. And this is why we see a huge rise of shaming campaigns across the environmental movement, especially. Um, but you can, you know, say, oh, well, what's minimum wage? Well, minimum wage varies across states, but it's set at the state level, right? And then there's a federal baseline. And in these cases, every so everyone's having to set, set their own standards, what's acceptable, um, what is acceptable behavior. And in doing the book, and it was published in the UK as well, there are fewer examples 
that really catch your eye in the UK. And I think that's because they do have still, I mean, probably not to a degree that they're satisfied with or that some people are satisfied with, but more government intervention. And shame is one of those things that really steps in, in the power, in the hands of the people when the government isn't doing the job that, that we want it to. So I think that's also why we see this this infiltration and maybe why we'd, we'd like to be relieved of some of this policing of big box retailers. You know, like why are any of them selling endangered species kind of thing? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming. And this is, it's interesting to know the distinguish between, distinguish between uh, guilt and shame. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, is remorse and regret very important to distinguish between? Because when, uh, when it comes to the differentiation between shame and guilt, it's, I think uh, s there's a certain level of social consciousness that's needed to know uh, the difference between remorse and regret, the line that's drawn between remorse and regret, what to do and what not to do at the same time. So how much of a factor is remorse and regret when it comes to uh, d distinguishing between shame and guilt? Thank you. So, I mean, I will say I distinguish very clearly what I mean by shame and guilt in the book, but these are not settled upon terms, right? So I just wanted to outline at the beginning what I, how I was defining them. I don't really talk a lot about remorse and regret specifically, but I do talk about the role of the apology, which is an expression of a regret. Now, whether or not that's genuine, in the, in the case that we don't really know if any expression is genuine, aside from the blush, it's the most honest signal. But um, there is a lot of evidence to show that a very good apology washes away a, quite a bit of shame. And if you can add maybe like 40 billion in philanthropy money, like Bill <laughs> Gates did, the apology, the philanthropy, uh, you know, the, the sort of um, rebranding the, the William H. the Gates as the Bill and Melinda Gates, it all helps a lot. <laughs> he went from having the, some of the lowest rank uh, reputation, I mean, he hired also a major reputation management firm but he did sort of repair his reputation, I think, in genuine ways with the public. Now he's one of the most trusted philanthropists and, and tech people out there. So it shows that it's totally possible. Yeah. I don't know where he falls on the regret <laughs> remorse, whether or not he feels either, but he did ex express some of that in the public eye. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Well, you took on quite a topic. Uh, yeah. um, I, I've been studying shame on and off for about 15 years with a place called the Tompkins Institute. It's out of Philadelphia. And Tompkins was a man who wrote in a very complex way who was sort of interpreted by somebody named Nathanson. And the organization came apart, I think, because shame is the least understood um, uh, emotion or affect in our culture. I have a lot to say. I'm going to try and make it short. Um, children, babies are born with a sense of shame. You can see it if you do an experiment because by our definition, anytime you interrupt interest, say I'm walking down the street and somebody hits me up, my interest is in going straight and not being interrupted. It's a physiological sort of a deflation and it's normal. Right? And if we didn't have it, we could never find out if we had offended an individual or a group and make reparation. So one thing I wanted to say was I'm not sure we're very good at teaching kids in school or education, you know, in an educational way, what happens when you shame someone? What do you say? How do you know? Because the other thing that people do is they do everything they can but feel this sort of stupid, sinking, falling into the floor feeling because it makes you feel so weak. So instead they get mad, I'm going to get you, you know, or I'm worthless, like say maybe Woody Allen in a movie, you know, how he's always putting himself down, what's he dealing with, right? Or they get stinking drunk because that alcohol dissolves shame. Or they just avoid the situation like this. I mean, they, they show a lot of, you know, contempt. So, um, I guess, uh, to get to my question now, um, 
it's, it's important, I think, to give the people who are being shamed, because it's usually an individual or group, a, y you know, a way to make reparation, because that is the cure. Yeah. Right. And and if you get a funny, if you get one of these other more pathological, perfectly understandable reactions, having been taught usually by their parents or a group on what you're allowed to stay, say, and are you weak because you apologize? I mean, once it was really funny. I was in, in the in the Philly uh, train station and um, I managed to run over this very tall, angry looking guy's feet, not once, but twice with my you know, my little car, because I was like, where should I go, where should I go? And I went, oh, I'm sorry. The second time, I practically, you know, oh, please, because and he kind of looked at me, he actually almost smiled like, oh, stupid lady, I mean. But, I think you're touching on a lot of the things. Um, so uh, one that's interesting is that a lot of psychologists um, and anthropologists think that shame evolved as part of a rank-related emotion. So the expression that you're talking about, lowering your eyes, narrowing your shoulders, it's, first of all, a universal expression that even the people who are blind since birth exhibit. That's really interesting because that means it has a long evolutionary history. And for that reason, also the blush, which is linked to not just shame but embarrassment, but shame is a big one, uh, is... Uh, um, displayed more often in females than males and more often in, in the young than the old, which matches up, sad to say, very well with dominance hierarchy. So there's a, not to say, of course, that men don't feel shame or, and I also work with psychologists um, at UBC who study shame in the clinical setting and show that, um, for instance, high rates of shame among alcoholics and Alcoholics Anonymous is, is a high rate of predictive, it's a high predictor of whether or not they'll slip up and, and fall off the wagon again. And so we know the, the, the devastating effects, and those have been studied, I think, fairly well by people like you and, and others. But I do mm. think that uh, looking at how it's applied, not as an, an emotion, but as a tool at the group level, uh, is, a, is still a new area for exploration. And, and obviously, we have the anecdotes there, but I think there's, there's still a lot to be learned and a lot to say for it as a tool. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I just think that you have to understand basically where it comes from uh, to give a solution before you, yeah. you do it and be aware of what can happen when shame goes wrong. I mean, I heard a theory once. I have to stop talking, so I'm <laughs> hogging up the time. But no, anyway, it, I mean, I the worst case scenario me. is somebody who then doesn't want to reintegrate in society or maybe even, I mean, I, I cite a few of these cases in the book, but where their behavior then just becomes even, it escalates even further in the bad direction in response to the ostracism. So this is, these are all possibilities. But what's interesting about corporations as opposed to individuals is they have stock value. They have to answer to shareholders. They have to be visible in the public. They don't have that option the way an individual does to sort of go on a rampage, although we can probably point to a few that, that have. Hi. Mine's a little bit shorter. Um, I'm wondering if, if both or either of you can talk a little bit about how cultural differences can cause challenges so far as shame campaigns. I mean, I'm thinking you know, specifically of, of endangered species in Africa um, and so many Asian cultures yeah. you know, see, see medicinal benefits of various types, um, slaughtering dogs, I mean, that yeah. type of thing that is very easy to convince a Western audience, not so much yeah. the Eastern audiences where things are going on. I mean, you, you probably have some specific Greenpeace examples, but what I love about shame is its social nature and its cultural relativity. And so you find an example I cite is um, the Bakari Indians in the Amazon. They, uh, they're naked at all times. They don't wear clothing. But they think it's incredibly shameful to eat alone. So if you were eating alone there, they would feel so mortified on your behalf and avoid you. And... Mm -hmm. Transfer that to the U.S. context. I mean, it doesn't match up at all, right? I mean, the nakedness would be shameful. The eating alone, we all do it. You know, 28% of Americans live alone. So it's so relative. And that's what's cool about shame is it's a tool. It's calibrated at all times to the norms, to the cultures. And so you have to, there's just no way to, to run it any other way. But I will say that when we're talking about the climate change or you know, even some more regional stuff like air pollution, there's not a lot of room for a lot of different ideas about what's right. You know, there's 
there's the going to be a prevailing norm. The learning curve is very steep. Societies have to very quickly realize. It oh should God, hopefully be steep. Matters. Exactly. So in those cases, I am less concerned about, you know, the nakedness versus being alone, because again, I don't really see that as a social dilemma. Um, but in some of these other ones, I think the norms will have to move rather quickly. And I think in Ecuador or here or China, it's going to be the same if people really see the, the impacts of, of environmental devastation or animal, animal welfare. It's a little harder one. But. Yeah, or like the dolphins in, um, in Japan. I mean, yeah. there are, I mean a, a lot of the Japanese citizens have been yeah. convinced that that's the wrong thing. I mean, not the majority, but I mean, they're peeling away certain segments of society, which is a start. We had to also be convinced, right? So yeah, we're all, process. it's always just a battle of, of the norms. Do you have any like specific context? Well, I was just gonna go back to your seven habits. I mean, it, it, as you said, it's all relative. So um, if I wanted to shame people in Iceland about Icelandic whaling, it'd be difficult if people in Iceland felt basically didn't feel shame around. Yeah, and it could backfire if we were not seen as the appropriate messenger for that. Um, to the point where, like, we Greenpeace know that if, <clears throat> if that was the approach that we took, it would just the response would be a nationalistic one, and it, yeah. it would backfire. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's very tricky. You have to develop, yeah. develop a new. So you're recruiting approach. people from Iceland into Greenpeace, or yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. To Question over here on your oh, right. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi there. <clears throat> I've been working in the field, maybe you know, organization development, changing uh, corporate culture. Cool. Mostly in the states, in the corporate and government sectors. Um, and I've never come across the issue of shame and guilt in all of my many decades in this uh, area. Um, and then I've worked overseas a lot in anti-corruption issues in uh, great countries like Afghanistan, Nigeria, Egypt, Bangladesh. And there the cultural norm is when you get into an office, you take what you can. And there's no sense, I mean, people resent politicians, but they still vote for them, mostly out of ethnic or tribal loyalty, not out of anything ideological, as we might have more so in this country. Can you address uh, shame and guilt in terms of the corporate culture of a country where taking as much as you can while you can is the norm? Well, um, again, because shame is calibrated to that norm, I wouldn't expect there to necessarily be then a lot of shame around behaving in that manner. Um, but I will say that I don't think it's overt necessarily in corporate culture in the U.S., but I came across, I mean, not to bring it back to poor Bill Gates, but he had written an op-ed in the New York Times called Shame is Not the Solution, and he was, actually, he was very upset about the prospect of teacher evaluations being made available online. And I, this actually isn't a shaming policy, it's a transparency policy because everyone's behavior is equally made available. And he said um, very explicitly in the title, of course, Shame Not Being the Solution, what's interesting is that um, he had borrowed, Microsoft had borrowed, um, Jack Welch's strategy of stack and rank. And stack and rank was very much a shaming policy within organizations. Um, started, of course, in GM. My Microsoft borrowed it, where um, every six months they would rank the employees from top to bottom. And the bottom two were often publicized and often threatened with then real punishment, losing their job, right? With it, when Kurt Eichenwald wrote the piece for Vanity Fair on Microsoft and having not been an innovative co company for the last decade or so, um, he, in every, every employee that he interviewed, cited stack and rank as the reason why innovation was stifled in Microsoft. And I think that's really telling. I mean, I, it's one thing that I speculate on in the book, and I don't know that I'm right, but I do think that social dilemmas is what, is the kind of thing that lends itself to shaming well because we're all in it together. Innovation, creativity, I cannot imagine using shame in an effective way in those situations. So I don't know if Jack Welch was using it more in a social dilemma like situation in his in his company, but certainly at Microsoft, it was the worst application it seems of of organizational behavior um, or or application of shame at the corporate level. 
And then one more thing about corporations, which I, I liked. I found a study that looked at CEO behavior in Russia. So they also are apparently notorious for sort of bad behavior, um, or what we would see bad behavior. But if they published about their company's behavior in a Russian newspaper, it didn't matter. But if it was in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, the CEO would resign. And they track this over a long period of time. So again, coming back to the source of shaming mattering, for them, the Anglo exposure did matter in a way that the Russian exposure didn't. And I don't think that can be generalized, but it was an interesting case study. All right. Um, you were talking a little while ago about the greatest example of shame. And the thought came to me, well, after World War I, you know, Germany was forced to pay all these reparations, right? And uh, that led to Nazi Germany. So how do you keep something like that from happening and right now you sort of see the the yeah. tea leaves of that developing in Washington DC. We have, you know, the the liberals have been winning the last few years and they all want to shut the republicans out. And what's going to happen is it's going to come back with a bang. One other point is that when you, you talk I'm about corporations banged already but well, okay. I mean, it, it seems to go back and forth. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, but two years later it'll be all different again. Yeah. And the other thing is that corporations are some of the most democratic operations you'll ever see. You don't like what GE is doing? Buy a share of stock and you can you know, vote against the chairman or the board of directors. You can't do that with an organization like NYU or Greenpeace. Uh, we, as outsiders, we don't have a say. You know, we're either a customer as a student or yeah. we're a paying member, but you can't fire the management. But the way the American corporate system is set up, you can file suit in Delaware, and there are laws, and people are respected, and so there's a whole system. Yeah. And then one final point, I know I'm, I'm dominating the floor here, but and, and that is, how do you stop shame from becoming sort of a, a cabal and developing into a mob mentality? Obviously, that's not what you're looking for. It, it works in nice, civilized environments, but... What about in a world where there was slavery? What about on the internet? I mean, yeah. that's where you see a huge amount of disproportionate punishment, behaviors that make us very uncomfortable, and anonymity plays a big role in that as well. I mean, of course, I don't have all the answers. What's cool is that because shaming is a social tool and it requires an audience is that we're all part of that. I mean, that's kind of the point of the book is for all of us to be asking ourselves these questions and to be considering how we how we use the tool um, in terms of the backfiring situation and I think one of the countries that perhaps we all worried about a little bit is North Korea who <laughs> it was funny because North Korea is seen as such an outsider that it often doesn't come up but when North Korea joined the World Cup I think it was 2012 right um, then there was all of this attention on North Korea's bad practices, and it decided it wouldn't join the World Cup mm -hmm. again. Because when it decided to be part of the group, it then opened itself up to sort of the group standards and the group shaming in a way that it then really didn't, didn't appreciate. So we do have countries like that. I mean, you could argue in some respects the U.S. is that at, at Kyoto or the Convention on Biological Diversity. I mean, and what I like is to keep our eye on that ball rather than on this cabal internet uh, angry at, at Brian Williams outrage spending five hours reading all the gossip I mean I know it's hard because it's so personal and it's so relatable but it just feels like you know we 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 are aware of our like finite capacity to lend our lend our voice or our attention to these issues so I don't know if that I, I don't have the answers but I think it's yeah. I think it's fascinating. And good job on the radio this afternoon. I heard oh, your interview. Thanks. So. Oh, and just the you said corporations are democratic. I mean, that's kind of the soft underbelly of the corporation is that it does have – it has to answer to reputation, which it hates because it would like to just answer to revenue and cost. And that's kind of this – I mean, I hate to sound like starry-eyed about the publicly traded corporation at all, but it is the cool part of it is that a blackfish can can affect SeaWorld's stock value. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody.